lecture, and I know so many of you, like me, are so excited about this. So we are very happy that Sabine is here. Uh, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta's China Institute. He has a PhD in Chinese architectural history and theory from Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, and his dissertation was about traditional Chinese style in Moscow. He's currently an assistant professor at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing. Uh, his research, which is very interesting, includes consulting Western sources for information on Chinese Islam and Chinese Islamic architecture. And the reason is to determine how far back this subject has been studied in the West, to refine <coughs> his research based on those <coughs> sources in the West and in China, and to build a framework of analysis to determine when the Chinese mosque was originally established. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sadiq Jabra. Okay. Uh, before I start, before I forget, I should thank the Department of Art and Design for allowing me to present here at this speaker series. Uh, to the Tampa Institute, who is co-sponsoring this, and who has also welcomed me and gave me space to do my postdoctoral research, as well as the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, who is also co-sponsoring my postdoctoral research. Okay, so this is me. Um, and just in case, if you're in the wrong room, you're welcome. And if you're in the right room, also welcome. So this is just in case you wanted to know. So today we're going to do the Chinese mosque. And it's very big. Um, so let's see what is the Chinese mosque. Um, I broke it down into five things, so at least I'll start with Chinese Islam so you have sort of an idea of what kind of Muslims we have in China and uh, sort of how long they've been there. We'll look at the types of mosques in China. So there's not just one type of mosque, there are several types of mosques. Uh, then we'll look at the Chinese mosque and then I'll explain what I mean by when I say the Chinese mosque. And then we'll look at components that make Chinese mosque different. So there are some things that are a little bit different than other mosques found around the world. And then hopefully we'll have time to finish it off with changes in the mosque space. And here I, I, I do mean also the buildings itself, but then I also mean where the buildings are situated as well in the larger urban scheme. Because there is a lot of changes going on. Okay, so that's what we'll do today. So let's start with Chinese Islam. So I didn't put a lot, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how long China, uh, Islam has been in China. So traditionally, probably through their oral history, they have found dates of 628 to 29 when Islam has arrived in China by the sea route. And this date is problematic to some people because uh, Muhammad dies in 632. So people are like, how can Islam have magically shown up in China before the Prophet is still alive or has, hasn't died yet? So this date, through their tradition, they keep, but it might not really be the exact date. But then we have an official date of 651, and this is in the court records where a delegation was sent from the uh, dynasties in the in that area, and they officially sent a delegation to Chang'an, which is today Xi'an, and said, here we are, we're the new Muslim empire, and just introduced themselves. And by this time, there were probably Muslims living in Chang'an, maybe as traders, as business people, just common people, probably not official, official imams or official um, officials from the Islamic empire, uh, there were probably Muslims living in today's Guangzhou, which was Canton. Um, probably just regular guys who converted and then doing business, and this is how Islam slowly comes in. By 756, 763, so before this date, we have the uh, uh, China trying to spread into Central Asia, and they were defeated and went back. And then a few years later, they have a rebellion in Chang'an. And 
they were overwhelmed and asked, so by this time they have contact with the Islamic Empire. And they asked the Arab troops, please come and help us. We're a little overwhelmed, we need your help. So they sent these Arab troops over and they helped put down the rebellion. And the emperor was so happy, he said, well, if you want to stay, you can stay. And so by this time now, these Arabs have now officially settled and we can officially, officially say Islam is there. And this is kind of the start of Chinese Islam. So this is up to this point, we're seeing Islam in China. And I think at this point now, we're starting, once they've settled, they're intermarrying and they're converting people, converting Chinese. And this is where we see the change from Islam in China to Chinese Islam. Okay, so that gives you just a really brief history. And of course, Islam continues from this time all the way to today. Okay. I have a map. I don't remember why, but that's okay. Uh, the map is basically to say, well, there's China. Uh, and just to show you that there's the sea route. It came around from here, goes through this strait, and then ended up here. And this is kind of how Islam first came in, through the sea route, and then up to here, and then there's mosques along the coastline. And then the second route is from here through the land, the silk route that we know, through here, Kashgar, into China and then down into Xi'an, which is here. And it's easier to see this map, oops, this map, because um, I kind of drew it out. So there is the, this is Guangzhou, today's Guangzhou. So they came here, they went along the coast. There were a couple of mosques here, only one stands today. And then this is the land route. It split in Xinjiang. There was a northern and a southern route. Then it rejoined in somewhere over here and then went down to Xi'an. And so, over time, um, Islam then moves north from here and south from here and spreads all over China. And that's how it's spread over time. Okay, so what kind of Muslims do we have? Well, the majority of Muslims in China are Sunni from the Hanafi school. There is one small minority and they are Shia, uh, Shia Ismaili. And I will show you one of their prayer spaces in a moment. Um, and then within this Sunni Hanafi, we have a number of groups or schools of thought or however you'd like to look at it. And the first one I put, the Gudimu or Al Gudimu, the Al Qadim, is the officially old teachings, as they would call it. This is the original teachings that came across those early dates I showed you. This is where it stems from. This is the group that's been there the longest, and this is the group that. Uh, has ties all the way back to the beginnings of Islam in China. And they are quite a big group, although they're shrinking a little because of the other groups. Um, we then have the Ikhwani, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, some people say it has ties to Egypt, some people say not. So I'm not 100% sure. They may or they may not, but uh, they could have because of course Islam has ties still to the Middle East, still has ties. Even in the Qing Dynasty, the ties stopped during the uh, uh, beginning parts of the Re uh, People's Republic of China and then completely stopped during the Cultural Revolution and then ties picked up again after the Cultural Revolution ended and China opened, basically had the economic reforms and the opening of China is when ties started up again. We have the, we do have small groups of Salafists. Um, actually, most Chinese Muslims don't like them. So this group doesn't grow very big, but it is there. And a lot of these are coming also because some imams, some students are sent overseas, Pakistan or to Saudi Arabia, excuse me, to study. And so they're bringing back a lot of this um, teachings. And so they, they've started this group. And then there's the Shida Han. Uh, the Shi Daotang is uh, a mix of the Sufi, Sufism and a mix of other things, a little bit of Buddhism as well, and mixed all together and to make this new order. But they're all still classified as Muslims. It's a very small group, only centered in Gansu, uh, I believe, and just in two or three towns. It's not very, very big. Um, so if we look at the Lao Gadimu, they are what they call old teaching, the original. And then all the Yehwani, Salafi, Shidaotang, and even the Sufi orders, they're all called new teachings. These are things that have appeared in China in the Qing Dynasty, probably after the 1800s. 
and this is what they call the new teachings. And then there's the Sufi orders. Uh, some of them come from the Naqshbandi tradition from Central Asia. And then there's four groups of them, the Jahriya, Qadariya, Kufiya, and Kubruya. Okay. Now, Muslims in China, there are 56 ethnic minorities or ethnic nationalities. So they're all Chinese. Uh, according to China, uh, but some of them have their own cultures and traditions. Some of them are actually very Chinese, but they have their own cultures and traditions. Some of them are um, groups that are caught in China once the borders were made. Uh, some groups such as uh, Koreans in the northern, northeastern part of China, they were just over on this side of the border when China formed, and so they become an ethnic uh, minority or nationality. So uh, out of the 56, 10 officially follow Islam. The biggest is the Huizu, and they are the, what I will call the traditional Chinese Muslims, the actual Chinese Muslims. These are the ones that are probably, when the Arab troops came and converted and intermarried and had children, this is the group that they made, the Huizu, and they continue to today. They intermarry, they look very Chinese. Uh, some actually sometimes don't look Chinese, and this comes, of course, from the past, depending on uh, their family ties. But a lot of them look very Chinese, they speak Chinese, they mix with the Chinese community very easily. The only difference is that they are Muslims, so they will, won't eat pork, they won't drink alcohol, and so this kind of puts them apart. But when you look at them, you can't really tell that they are Muslim. We have the Uyghurzu, the Uyghurs, and this is the group that's in the news now. They are mainly situated in Xinjiang. They are the ones being oppressed today. Um, the other groups are also facing, facing oppression as well, but this is the main group that's facing the, the biggest crackdown and uh, detention and eradication of their culture. We then have Kazakhs, we have Kyrgyz, we have Tajiks, and the Tajiks are the only Shia group uh, there may be some Kyrgyz who are Shia, but there's, it's very hard to pin down. Um, then there's Uzbeks, Tatars, Salar. The Salars are from Turkmenistan, and that they move over into China. It's a very small group. Uh, there's the Dongxiang and the Balan. And additionally, there are three other groups, or I put them in here. Uh, there's Tibetan Muslims. The, some of them are Hui and some of them are another smaller ethnic group, but they are not classified as way. Uh, they are classified as Tibet in, on their identity document. They're, they're not given that status, but there are some that are. And there is a, 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 a mosque in Lhasa, I believe it was burned down during the, the riots in 2008, and I think it's been rebuilt. There are some Mongolians that are Muslim. Uh, Inner Mongolia is full of Muslims. Um, and then there's Han Chinese. And these Han Chinese actually are today convert, converts uh, to Islam. So they've decided, I like Islam, I'm going to convert, but they can't change who they are on their ID card, and so they're harder to classify. Now when I say hard to classify, it's because even though China tolerates religion, and they do tolerate, in their constitution it says religion is okay. What's not okay is converting people. So these uh, Chinese who do convert, they do it secretly, or they do it quietly. They'll convert, they won't tell anybody, and then they'll go on their merry way. So when we're trying to look for numbers, it's very difficult to pin down exactly how many Muslims there are. Uh, some people say 20 million. I asked uh, scholars of uh, Huizu scholars, and they said 20 million is only Hui. And then you have everybody else. So there could be 30, there could be 40, there could be 50, but they don't make a large amount of the population, maybe 2% or 3%. But when we look at the actual numbers, that's still a lot of Muslims compared to other countries. Okay, so those are the Muslims. So now, now we know what the Muslims are, who they are. Well, let's look at the different types of mosques that we find in China. So here's China again. And when we say, where are the mosques, uh, basically, everywhere, all over China. That's where we find all the mosques. There's no one place where there's no mosque. There's mosques everywhere. Of course, there's larger uh, amounts of mosques here in this area, in Xinjiang, in Qinghai, in Gansu, and over here, in Ningxia, in this 
area here. But there are lots of Muslims also on the east. There's a large population here in Hanan. So these Muslims are just about everywhere. And that's like I said, they, they're easy to mix with the population. The, some of them are, do, because of the uh, cultural revolution, have become farmers, but some are business people. And as business people, they move around. And because mosques tended to be in urban places, they tend to be in almost all large cities. Okay, so types of mosques, I have a list. This is how I broke them down. Somebody might disagree, and that's okay. Uh, because no one's really classified what type of mosque we have. So I'm trying to classify them as well. So I said there's a historical Arabian style, there's a contemporary Arabian style, um, and I say Arabian, but I don't mean like Arabs, but I mean like maybe Middle Eastern or Islamic stereotypical, what we kind of consider Arabian style. Um, contemporary mixed style, there's Central Asian and I say Persian style. Uh, it's mainly Central Asian, but there's even some influence from Persia because we look at the Silk Route and there's influence from Iran and it goes through Central Asia. So we do see some styles or some decorations or some other things that are partially Persian style. They mix them together. And then other nationalities and minority styles. Um, these might be also Chinese style, but I group them here because they don't really belong to the Hui. And the Hui, because I said they are more of the traditional Chinese. Uh, Muslims, and that's why I'm trying to find traditional Chinese mosques. So this is how I've separated them. And so that's why sometimes people might disagree. Um, I'm including some other prayer spaces, even though they're not mosques. Um, because in China, everything seems to be a mosque. At least that's how they classify it. They don't really have another name for it, uh, except uh, the mazars. And I'll show you that. But I thought, put them in here just to give you an idea of what else is there beside mosque. And there's not very many, but there are a few other prayer spaces. And then I go to the traditional Chinese style mosque. And once I get there, then I will really explain why I've classified it this way. Okay, so first one, the historical Arabian style. There it is, it's in Fujian. It's the only stone mosque left standing. There may have been others. They don't exist anymore, but this is the only one left standing. It was built in 1009, the Song Dynasty. Um, that's all that's left. This is the front part. I'll show you in a minute the prayer hall. This is the prayer hall, actually, um, right here. So when you enter, and then you will just turn around and go into the prayer hall, and I'll show you that in a moment. So most of this stuff is missing. There's no minaret. More than likely, they called the prayer on the top of here, because minarets at that early time also were not um, very prominent. They usually did not go higher than two stories, or about this high. Um, and that was because of planning rules, imperial planning rules. Most cities were fairly flat, one story, at most two stories, because everything was so close together, they would want people with three, four stories, and then they can stare into the neighbor's house. So this was kind of for consideration of your neighbor that they had these urban planning rules. And so this is why a lot of places in China, historically, at least the traditional ones, don't have very, very tall minarets. These come much later. Okay, so there's, this is the inside. There's no roof left. It was probably made of wood, and that's probably why it's disappeared. Um, this is the front of the mosque. This is the mihrab here. And if you go up these little door things they have here, behind here they built a little museum, and they've collected all the uh, material that they've found here, all the stonework, the Arabic uh, uh, calligraphy that was on the stones, they're all collected in behind. So they haven't really, hopefully they've got most of it, but some of it might have disappeared. Okay, so that's the Arabian style. Then we have the contemporary Arabian style. That's what it looks like. So very stereotypical, the, the, when we talk about mosque and we say mosque, this is what we think of. And this one is actually next door to this one. It's right on the same lot. And the Omani government said, oh, there was Muslims here before. It's, a, it's supposed to be a Muslim site. So we're going to help you build this beautiful mosque which unfortunately you're not going to use, and they don't. Uh, this gets used maybe once a year for, for the, the Eid, maybe twice a year for two Eids. It depends how many people show up. Actually, a lot of the Muslims don't live here anymore, so they don't need this mosque. But this is, the government felt like they wanted to spend the money and give them this beautiful mosque, and so this is where we see this contemporary style. And they're still building like this as well. Uh, there was a new one built in Iwu. Uh, I don't have a picture because I have not gone there yet. And that was just recently put up. There's this kind. This one's in Kowloon, Hong Kong. 
and this is also a rebuilt one. There was another original one, and it was probably not, it was probably also Western style as well. And then this was built more in Arabian style, and the original mosque was torn down. And then there's this kind. This is in Shanghai, and this is what they're building. And so when I look at the changes in space, I'll explain this a little bit more in detail. But there you go, there's your tall minaret, and there's your nice little dome, and it's very Islamic architecture, but it really doesn't fit with within its urban context because everything around it is very Chinese or very Western, as you can see the tall apartment buildings. Then we have this, what I call mixed style because I have nowhere else to put it. And this is what we have because it's not really that dome. It is not really a square building with a dome. It's a round building. I've never seen a round uh, prayer hall before. Well, there you go, there's a round prayer hall. It's got this round dome with windows. And, but there's still very Chinese elements around it. Like these buildings are very, still very Chinese around it. But this is the only one. So it's, it's not really Arabian style, it's contemporary style, and we don't know where to put it. So I've kind of called it mixed. So when we want to really see a mixed style, here's a real mixed style. <laughs> so there was probably an original traditional style here that they tore down, and they built this thing building, put a few arches on here, and said mosque. And then they said, well, we need to make it really a mosque, but we'll put some domes on top. <laughs> and there you go, mixed style, right? That's how we're going to make it. And then you can see right be beside it, very Chinese, still newer buildings, but still very Chinese in its decoration and its roof structure. So even the whole courtyard is very mixed. So this is mixed style. This is what they're building now. They're tearing down beautiful old mosques and building this. And so it's very, very terrible. Then we have Central Asian style, or Persian style. This is the Xinjiang style. This is the ones we find mainly in Xinjiang. There it is. So this is one of the biggest ones in Kashgar, the Yidka Mosque. Um, now with the crackdown, they don't gather here anymore. And in uh, Eids, in big festivals, the whole square would be full of people. The whole mosque would be full of people. But unfortunately, now with the crackdown, they're even not allowed to use the square, let alone using the prayer spaces. And this was taken a few years ago where people are still there. They have beautiful shops here where you can buy all your Islamic wares. And a lot of these are now disappearing. So here's a close-up of the, of, the, of the main entrance. This is, once you go inside, there's an indoor prayer hall, which is this one. And then there's a lot of outdoor prayer spaces. And uh, indoor is mainly for use in the winter because it gets cold. And uh, outdoor is because it's quite hot there and it's nice to use the outdoor spaces. So here's a picture of the inside space. And the mihrab is here. It's very narrow and very long. It's a very narrow and long space. And this narrow and long space from the inside continues to the outside. So the interior is there and that wall there. And then it just continues all the way down. And so this space can fit a lot of people because this is the main main mosque. There are other smaller mosques there, but this is like the main mosque for Friday prayers, the main mosque for large Eid prayers. These are all that here at this mosque. There's another one in Turpan. So this one's also very nice and it's a, a adobe structure. It's a very nice big minaret. There's another view of it. There's a close-up of the minaret. It shows you some of the nice decorations. And this is the interior. Almost very similar, except this one's not long, this one's very, uh, this one's not wide, but very long. And then the mihrab is here in the front. Okay, so now we get to the other nationalities, minority styles, and including different prayer spaces that are not mosque. So, when I show you this one, you're gonna go, well, isn't that Chinese? It looks very Chinese to me. And yes, we can argue it is kind of Chinese, but it belongs to another minority group. It belongs to the Turkmenistan group, the Salar group. And so here, this was, uh, at the time I went, it was a holiday, and all the kids here were attending their little uh, Islamic winter camp. So they come here to actually learn Chinese, learn, uh, they had, sometimes had English classes, and they also had Quran classes for them. And so it is sort of Chinese, Yes, in its outlook, in the roof style, but the minaret's roof style is quite different. It's not Chinese style at all. And we don't see this very steep roof style in Chinese. We see this kind of roof style a lot in, uh, in Xinjiang, in Gansu, in Qinghai. 
and this is where they're building this type. And it's always found in mosques or Islamic structures. And so even though it is looks very Chinese, even these structures in a Chinese in a Chinese architecture, they're called dogong or the bracket sets, which are structural and also are very decorative, and they help hold the roof up, especially to give up. Uh, push the roof out further. But here, even though they look like dogong, they're not. They're just pretending to be. They actually, a lot of these are just flat pieces that are fanned out. And we can see, I'll show you another one where you'll see it even closer. Here. You can see that these are all just flat pieces that are sticking out. There's no real bracket sets going on anywhere here except maybe here in the stone. And those are decorative more than anything. And so again, it's mixed style, it's not quite Chinese, it's not quite the traditional Chinese style that we're looking for. And this is their prayer hall. And again, these look like the bracket sets, but they are not. And you can see here, they're very flat, and this is what they are. They're just very flat pieces held together to mimic the bracket sets, but they're not exactly. Then we have this prayer space called Gongbei, and that's what Gongbei is. It's a kuba, it's a mazar. Here's all the different words for it. And that's it in Chinese. But it's still a mosque. But I wouldn't even, I would argue it's still not a Chinese style either, even though it looks very Chinese. The roof styles are very different. But there is again, the bracket sets are not Chinese at all. They're very flat panels here holding up that roof. The stairways are very different too. In, in the traditional Chinese mosque, which I'll show you and it will become more clear, the stairways are always here, you just walk up the stairs straight into the mosque. Here, you have to walk from the side and then go up. And so they're changing how even the, you enter into these buildings. Now why is this a, this one doesn't show it very clearly, but next door to it, in here, is the mother part. This is where their saints are buried, and this is where there is a dome. I couldn't enter here, but I have a picture of another one that I can show you. So this one is called Baba Se. It's uh, also a Gongbei Amazer in Sichuan. So still kind of looks Chinese style until you go to the front. And there's that very steep roof-like structure. And actually, fa in, in fact, you see this kind of shape in some of the minority groups' hat that they wear. It's very uh, distinct shape that also shows up in their hats. Not in this guy's hat, but in other minority groups. And then there's the mother part. So here's that dome, here's the main, main saint, and then here's other, other guys who are also important, who are buried here, and then they come and drape their uh, sort of clo cloth on there, venerate them, and they all come here. And you can see all the pots in front. This is where they would put their incense sticks when they go there to, to do their venerations and other things. Okay, and then this is the Tajik, Ismail, the Ismailis, the Shias, and there's their Jamaat Khan. This is a newer one. And what happened was the village in, uh, next to this uh, was on the other side of the mountain. And there was a landslide or some disaster. Their village was destroyed. So the government said, we're moving you. Pick them up, move them to the other side of the mountain, rebuilt their village, and built them a new Jamaat Khan. And even though this is a newer one, actually they all look very similar. There's a very large courtyard usually in the middle, and then this is their prayer space here. And most of them look very similar, maybe some small design differences, but almost all laid out the same. Okay, so now we get to the main part, the Chinese mosque. What is it? Okay, so I call it the traditional Chinese mosque. Usually it's the way that they're using it, and why do we call it that? Well, this is what it should look like. Usually, the traditional Chinese mosque, if nothing is being torn down, will have a prayer hall. We'll have two side halls called Jiang Tang. And I'm standing actually in the minaret itself over the main entrance. And so they might have a minaret here uh, or another structure, which I will introduce in a moment. And it's very much like Chinese architecture. So if you go to a Chinese temple, it's the same thing. Nothing is stuck together. There's separate buildings, and there's always building in space, buildings in courtyard, and there's always everything is in pieces. And then in as well with the temple, as this is not a temple, but if it was a temple, you'd enter from south, go to north, and on the north end, you'd have the biggest hall for the Buddha statues. 
and that would be the main hall. So same in the mosque, you enter the mosque and at the main end you'd have the big prayer hall. Now this doesn't always work in every mosque because a lot of these, this one's in a small village so it, it tends to work, but in cities sometimes depending on where it is your entrance may not always be here which is in the east because all mosques face west. Well you might have an entrance in the west which is fine and then you just enter around the prayer hall and then still end in the same space. So they always keep this space no matter where the entrance end tends to be. It could be east, west, north or south. The configuration tends to stay the same. Um, this is the main prayer hall and again here this one's a very big one. This one's in uh, Tianjin and some, some of these big ones will have a nice a uh, little covered area of Baosha where you can take off your shoes and hopefully not get them wet when it's raining and then you enter into the main prayer hall. It's very Chinese. You can see. You, if you entered this place and didn't know it was a mosque and you're looking at these signs going, hey, I'm in a Chinese temple. You, you wouldn't know where you were until you enter the space itself. And so this makes it very Chinese as well. What makes it also Chinese is these decorations up here. You find these in temples as well all the little people, all the little dragons, all of these things are still there. People are going, well, wait a minute. You're not supposed to have these things in mosques. Why are they there? This is a troubling question. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, because a lot of these mosques were, um, originally may not have had these actually. Uh, these may have just shown up when they were uh, reconstructed or renovated and then to make the make it more Chinese they were putting them up there. One way to uh, they defend themselves is say, well they say well there's no eyes on them. They pull out the eyes. So they're blind. So then therefore we can have them. So there's several ways of looking at it. Everybody has their own ideas and then this is another area of study that I'm digging into is why do they have them and how long have they been there? Are they just a new thing or have they always been there? Because they don't have to be there. They, they do occur in temples, but they don't have to be there in mosques to make it still Chinese style. So this is something that is an ongoing research that we haven't really found a clear answer for. Now here I'll just show you a whole bunch of different ones just so you get an idea that there's no similar ones. There's the one I put on the poster that's in Xi'an. But they're, they're all different from different time periods from different places. This one's in northeast China, it's in a small village. And all that's left here is that prayer hall. Everything else has been destroyed. And actually this was just recently rebuilt. So it's not that, that old, but they still kept the style. And the old stela is here, giving you the information of how long that mosque has been there. Here again, you can see I'm standing on the roof of a newly built concrete ugliness. And yeah, everything else has been destroyed. All that's left is this prayer hall. A lot of the sites I've gone to, all that's all that's left. Either a naked prayer hall like this, or enclosed in, in keeping the original courtyard, but uh, everything else was destroyed. This one, a lot of this was rebuilt. Um, I think their courtyard shrunk a little because they were building a highway and a new road, so they built lots of these concrete structures. There was a minaret um, in this place, uh, it uh, was bombed during World War II and fell down and because there was a lot of Japanese activity in this area so a lot of these mosques did lose their minarets because of, of, of the war. Uh, this one is in Shandong. Um, I will say it's a Qing Dynasty one and I know that because this minaret is occurring here. This is the back side of the mosque and this is above the Merhab. And Qing Dynasty minarets tends to occur in this area. There's some more examples. Uh, let me see where are we. This one is again Shandong in Jinan. This one is from Xianyang. Uh, this one is Tianshui in Gansu. And this one is in Zhejiang in, in, sorry, this one's Hanan. And so you can see there's no fixed style, but they're all very Chinese. And they're all very, what I would call traditional Chinese style, no matter where they occur. Here's a few more examples. Again, here's another example from Tianjin. There's two in Tianjin. Uh, this uh, and the second one from Jinan. This one from Southern Hanan. And this was just recently renovated. And then this one from uh, Puhat. 
in, in the Mongolia. Okay, so what makes them different? Well, they have this structure called Wang Yellow. What is a Wang Yellow? It means moon observation tower. And in Islam, you have the uh, calendar where you need to observe the moon because it's a lunar calendar. So you need to know, well, when's the next month coming? When does Ramadan show up? And when do we hold our prayers? So we need this little uh, structure. Now, it could be in addition to a minaret. So they could have this and minaret, or this could be minaret. So it has two functions. And you have to remember that these structures are in old cities where before electricity, so your whole city is going to be dark at night, so you can actually see the night sky, not like today where you can't see anything. So these actually were functional up until we started getting electricity and all this bright light in our cities, and then we no longer can use them. They don't use them today, of course, because we don't need to look up at the night sky. And of course, if they were using them as minarets, they don't use them in China because it's frowned upon to do the call the Adan from, from there. Um, you can also see that this is just a second story. It's hard to see here, but it's it's sorry. It's very uh, it's just a second story structure, and it's very Chinese in its thing. You can see here, hiding down in this corner, is a nice little dogong, and this is the real dogong. And this is a more of a Qing Dynasty one. It's small, it's decorative, has not so much structural um, stuff in there. Even though this mosque is quite old, it was rebuilt several several times. And this one is Niuji in Beijing. This one is in Hangzhou, in the Phoenix Mosque. This is, again is their Wang Yolo, their moon observation tower. This is the main entrance, and that's where they're sitting. And if you can read the Chinese, it does say Wang Yolo, in case you didn't know. So it's there, just to remind you that that's what it is. They put a lot of signs like this to tell you what the function of a lot of their structures are. Here's another one in Shandong, in a smaller town. And this one here forms a second entrance, so the main entrance wasn't this big. And then they put their observation tower, which also is kind of their minaret, but inside the uh, compound itself, not outside. Then we have prayer hall, and every mosque has a prayer hall, but I kind of put them in here because they're not exactly the same. Not the same in structure, maybe the same in use, but not the same in structure. And everyone is different. This one you can see that it has been partially rebuilt. And what did they do? Well, they replaced all these wonderful wooden columns with concrete columns. You can see them right there. And they, when and you know that they've been replaced because they're square, that gives you a good idea that they've been replaced. Because originally these were round. So these have all been replaced. But the interior is still wood. And very different than any mosque you would have visited. It's very compacted. This one's in a smaller village, so it's a little bit messy inside. Uh, if you see these curtained off areas, those are for the women to come and pray. And there are a lot of women, and you can see the women here cleaning after they finish Friday prayer. They're here cleaning, but they would have come here and prayed with the men. The men stand in the front. You also notice that there's Chinese here, even inside the mosque. But then as you move forward near the Merhab, that's where you start getting mostly Arabic calligraphy. This one in uh, Hanan, and here again you can see that these columns have been replaced, but that the interior is still the same. Here again, a Arabic calligraphy mixed with Chinese, and then Chinese up to here. And then if you're wondering what this is, I will mention this in a moment. This is the rear prayer hall, and I will show you a little bit more about that in a moment. This one is in uh, Ningxia. And so you can see, here's their little minaret, not very high. The nice uh, buildings on the side. This building is actually being used as a dormitory for students who've come there to study, to become imams. And this is the main prayer hall, and that's the inside. And then you can see there's a wooden structure here separating this front prayer hall from this rear prayer hall. And this one in Jinan. There's the side, we saw this one already, so you can see there's the front of it, there's the side of it, and there's the inside, it's quite big. So they're all different, they have their own style, they have their own local interpretations of what they want to put, but again, you can see as you move forward, there's lots of Arabic inside. And this is how we know that this is our prayer hall. 
Then, as I said, I was going to talk about this. This is the Yao Dian, which is a rear prayer hall. And I put all these pictures because really, this is the prayer hall up to here. This is the Qibla wall. And then they have this structure that sticks out. And it's not the Mirhab. Because inside here is the Mirhab. The de demarcation, the niche that shows you where is Qibla, where is Mecca. Right? And so this is the inside. There's the Mirhab. But this is the structure here. It's just this small little box. This additional. And here again, this one's almost the same size as the prayer hall. But here it is in the inside. Here's another example on the inside. And each inside is different. This one is a smaller one. Some, I term them as Mirhab within Mirhab. And so it's like this large Mirhab and then the smaller one within it. But it's not just that. It's not just decorative. These are useful. They are spaces that are used. And we can see that here. In this one, it's closed off. There's doors. Well, nobody really uses this because it's too big. And then we enter into here. Why is it closed off? Well, I've noticed in my research that these structures occur mainly in northern China. So it's led me to believe that possibly because some of these mosques, and you can see here, it's very big. They're not used on a daily basis because there's just not enough people. It's almost like a Friday mosque. Everybody just comes on Friday to pray. So they need a space that's a little smaller to accommodate people. And it's winter. It's cold. So what do you do? Well, you can't heat this whole space. That would get really expensive. And so you just build a small space and close it off and then heat it up. And so it's much easier to heat a smaller space. And so it's nice and warm because the imams are living there. They have to come pray five times. And they don't like it if it's cold either. So they have this little space where they can go in and it's warm in, in, in the winter. And these spaces do get very cold. Um, I, I visited these in the winter. I prayed in these in the winter. And it's not comfortable at all. <laughs> the floors are freezing cold. And so you really need a space like that. And it makes it more comfortable. I went inside, uh, let me show you this one. And it was beautifully warm. You really wanted to pray there. You didn't want to run away. It was very cold outside. I think it was minus 30 outside. And so this is why we have Yao Dian. And that's the whole function of it. And this, this character Yao comes from Kiln. So the little oven that we fire our pots or cook our pizza in. And uh, that's where we get that. Uh, that's where I've, uh, my research says that, well, okay, if you're using kiln, then that means warm, and then that's how I came to the conclusion that it has to be a place. And when you go there, you visit there, you do the site visits, then you know for sure, yes, that's what they are used for. Okay, so there's another one. And here you can see there's the mirhab sticking, sticking out, and then this is the yaw, the end here, and then enter into other halls. That's the inside of it. And then, mirhab. And you're saying, well, every mosque has mirhab. How can these be different? Well, they're like this. This entire wall. So most mirhabs, it's just this little tiny niche that's really nicely decorated. And maybe there might be some inscriptions on the outside. But these ones start spreading across the front qibla, uh, front qibla wall. And so this niche, in fact, doesn't stick out the back. It's actually just carved out of the wall. And then they put some wood around it to create this niche. Because most niches, even in Middle Eastern mosques, are carved, quite carved out. You can almost see them on the outside, especially in um, Middle Ages and late mosques. And even today, you can still see these mihrabs on the outside. And they're prominent, even from, from the outside. Well, these aren't. They can be like this, just a flat wall. They put this wooden board here. On, on these two footings, and they make a little niche that way. And so this makes mirhab. So you can almost see, well, you could change any space. By just putting something like this, you can make it into a mosque, as long as we're facing the west. They might have just this, a little signboard. That's it. That's their mirhab. It's inside this, what used to be the minaret. This is the Qing dynasty mosque, so the minaret is, of course, above the mirhab. So this whole bottom floor of the minaret becomes that niche. But then they had to put do something, so they've just put this movable board and says, okay, there, it's a little bit more beautiful than other places, that's our mirhab. Could be a niche, 
But even again, this is still just part of that wall. It's not pushed outside. You cannot see it on the outside wall. And it can be like this. Spread across the entire front Qibla wall. And again, this is just the wall. Nothing extrudes outside. And they push it in. They build this beautiful, ornate merhab. It continues on both sides. These are all Quranic inscriptions all across. And then on the right and the left, on the very, very ends, are built-in little minbars, right into the wall. And so this whole thing is just built into there. It doesn't move, the minbars don't move, everything is, is put in there. So this is the different types of mihrabs that we're seeing in Chinese mosque. And then there's minbar. A minbar is the pulpit, the stairs. It can be three stairs, five stairs, seven stairs, lots of stairs if you're in Turkey. Again, it, there's, the tradition has always been three to five. That's the tradition, the odd number, three to five, where the last top stair or the platform is not used mostly. I mean, there are some traditions who do use it, but for the most part, the top stair is not used. They, they say it's reserved for Muhammad. That's where he stood, so we're not gonna use it. We're gonna respect that, that's his space. And then they don't stand on the next two steps down because those are where the caliphs after Muhammad stood. So we're also going to respect that. We'll just go up one step, possibly two, depending on the size of the minbar. And during the khutbah, during the middle of khutbah, we sit down, we stand up again, we finish our, our khutbah, our sermon. And so that's what we have. Three steps, a platform, usually a nice dome on top. Well, we have Chinese minbar. Are you ready for it? That's Chinese minbar. So again, there's the steps, right? We could take that part off and it would just be steps and a platform. But now we're adding Chinese architectural elements to this thing. And this is not the most ornate or crazy minbar that we're seeing. This one is. <laughs> Our minbar is turned into this beautiful bridge. And we have this beautiful tower or pagoda or whatever you want to call it. And some of this architecture matches the outside of the mosque as well. And we're bringing a lot of these Chinese elements and saying, yes, we are Muslim, but we're also very traditional Chinese. And this is our minbar. We want to make it look like that. We don't want these Middle Eastern ones. And I didn't show you them. There are very simple minbars that look very similar to ones we find in mosques around the world. They're very similar. They've got very similar decorative elements. What I'm showing you is just the Chinese minbar. And this was part of my postdoctoral study my first postdoctoral study, finding the Chinese minbar. And so here we are, there's the Chinese minbar. Here's another example. This one is from uh, Gansu, uh, one, of the, um, one of the minorities uh, in their mosque, and it's like a little pavilion. And the minbar itself, there are steps, they're like right inside here. And so they would just use the front part of it, but very Chinese, just like a little pavilion, just like going to a little park and you'd have a little pavilion. Well, now they've moved it into the mosque. This one in uh, Shandong, in Taiyan. And again, very Chinese. A few more steps, but here's this beautiful pilo or gate or what they have here, very Chinese style. And then the top of the minbar here. And then how do they make it different? Well, we'll just add a moon and a star. And you'll see this structure, although I didn't show it very clearly, but the structure shows up on the top of prayer halls, uh, mosques, in the mosque, on top of the prayer halls. Some of them have this structure. Some of them just put this moon and star to say, hey, we're Muslim, this is our prayer hall. And so it's also brought inside because these become very, very architectural. Here's another one. And again, here's this pushed up against the wall and built out from it and built this little pavilion. And very simple one, but again, here's this railing system that we'll see in bridges and other areas. And so this very bridge-like, stair-like thing going up, this very Chinese element here on top, this very Chinese roof here as well. Even though it's not 100% Chinese, it's still a mix, but it's very Chinese in its outlook. Here's another one. This one's from Crane Mosque. And very Chinese still, even though its roof is not exact. It's still like a little pavilion in a park. We can walk up here, and sit, and enjoy our tea. Um, and we could find this in, in any park, but they put it on top of their, their minbar. 
and this one very architectural. This is enclosed, you can't use it, but look how Chinese and architectural it is. There's little doors, you think, oh wow, we can go inside. Actually, it's used for storage. They figure, okay, we have this space, we might as well just put all our old Qurans and everything inside. When we need them, we'll just take them out. And then it's very Chinese because here's these drums in front of this beautiful Chinese gate. And uh, here's that stick that they hold during the sermon. And so there it is. Here's a couple more examples from Jinan. And here we're seeing more ornate, more pilo, more of these or ornamental gates welcoming you to this. And we're seeing these minbars getting higher and steeper. Here's the top of this minbar, this beautiful pavilion on the top. And these beautiful dogong on the gate here, these bracket sets. Here's a, another similar one. Um, because it's in Jinan, it's just in another mosque. So the gates are very similar, but the, the tops are very different. Here it's a very much higher structure, very Chinese tower-like structure here. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.